Hello and welcome to the fourth webinar in the Organic Seed Production six webinar series organized by the Organic Seed Alliance and the Multinational Exchange for Sustainable Agriculture. We'll be hosting one webinar in this series on the third Tuesday of each month through November 2016 and you're welcome to attend as many of them as you'd like. This is your host Alice Formiga from the eOrganic Community of Practice. Today's presentation will last for about an hour and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. Today, we welcome back Lori McKenzie and Michaela Colley from the Organic Seed Alliance. Here's our picture. And um, we're also very grateful to have two special guests, um, two farmer presenters, um, Keith Kissler of Finn River Farm and Cidery and Sam McCullough of Nash's Organic Produce. Today, they'll be talking about how to know when to harvest your seeds, dealing with different and difficult weather conditions, and deciding what equipment to use. They'll also be discussing threshing and drying seed after harvest. So this is a lot to cover. So without any further ado, I will be handing the presentation over to Lori McKenzie and Kayla Colley. Thank you, Alice. As Alice said, we're gonna be covering um, how to know when to harvest your seed, and how to harvest your seed and what to do right after harvest. Uh, I also want to mention that our next webinar in this series will cover seed cleaning. So this webinar will um, not cover that component of after harvest and we invite you all to, uh, to tune in for the next session in October. Um, I also want to mention that at the end of the webinar, as Alice said, we will have time for question. And when it comes to knowing when and how to harvest your seed, it is so crop specific. And that's one of the reasons we have a couple of farmers here that are going to share some specific crops that they work with. Um, and we're going to try to give an overview of um, signs of maturity, signs of assessment of, of maturity, and generalities in uh, techniques, but there will be time to ask crop specific questions at the end as well. So I think that um, timing of harvest and judging the maturity of a seed crop is one of the most difficult uh, tasks for a beginning farmer. It's much easier to learn how to grow the crop and follow guidelines for spacing and so forth but that timing of, of harvest and maturity essentially is going to have a major impact on the quality of the seed that you harvest and is one of the trickiest pieces to, um, to learn over time. So it really is helpful to learn from other farmers and look at as many seed crops in the field as possible. Um, and, uh, but we're going to cover a few of the generalities. A major uh, component of the timing and technique is going to be how the seed is held on the plant, whether or not it is on a stalk or held inside of a pod, as you would see on a brassica or on a bean crop. Um, some seeds will also uh, shatter or shoot out of a pod, um, such as some peas and sweet peas. So those you need to really think about how you're going to catch the seed as well as as um, capture the uh, the un uh, distributed pods. Um, some seeds will hold in a head and they will stay there until you're ready to harvest and in that case it's a more of a matter of figuring out when the seed is mature enough to come in and harvest. And some seeds are held in bracts that will uh, shatter if they're lodged or fall over in the wind but can be more easily captured um, through cutting and threshing. Uh, there are also some seed crops that will blow away in the wind and um, how to capture those is a uh, key in timing of, of harvesting before the seed is dropped. And one good example of that is lettuce, which is the crop that you see in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide. And of course, there are also seeds that are held in fruits. And uh, clearly, the techniques are going to depend on which type of, of seed biology you're dealing with. This is a general slide just showing the range of degree of shattering out you need to consider depending on the family and then the in the middle of the crop column are just some examples of the crops that are typically grown for seed in each of those families and the larger degree of shattering the more difficult the harvest is to time and you need to consider whether you want to do multiple harvests or single harvests the techniques will be slightly different depending on which way you want to go more about that a little later on 
in the webinar today, but the overview slide of some of those differences. So knowing when to harvest is a matter of don't lose seed to shattering, but ensuring that the seed is fully mature. And that's really a balance. And I think one of the hardest things for beginning farmers is to accept the fact that you are not going to capture every single seed in the field. It's a matter of like each crop finding the timing when you're maximizing mature seed being harvested and the not losing too much seed that's been overmatured and lost to shattering. And most of our vegetable crops will mature sequentially. So you will have some seed on the plant that is, um, the, if you think about the structure of, um, of, a, of a carrot, a wild carrot or a, a cultivated carrot, that first flower has the most mature or the earliest maturing seed, and that's called the king umbel. And your secondary um, branches will have the second mature seed, and your tertiaries, the, the third tier of branches coming off of the plant will have the least mature seed. So the timing of harvest, you can go out and harvest the most mature seed by hand early on, or you can uh, harvest the entire plant when you're finding that ideal moment where you might have a little bit of shattering going on and a little bit of immature seed, but you're capturing the bulk of the crop with that timing. And in general, that early maturing first seed that's going to come off the plant is your most valuable and your most um, vigorous seed. So you want to time your harvest to capture as much of that initial fully mature seed as you can. So a lot of beginning seed savers also ask the question of, should I cut the water? Should I cut the water? Is it time to, and I, I think this is sort of an, an old wives tale of farming that people think of farmers saying, well, I got to cut the water so I can get that harvest in. And there is some truth to that, that when you stop watering, the plant shifts into um, uh, essentially pushing it towards senescence. And so it will speed up the maturation and dry down the plant to be prepared to harvest. But at the same time, you don't want to cut that water so early that you have immature seed on the plant and that early senescence is resulting in, um, in lower seed quality because the plant didn't get the opportunity to fully mature the seed. So water and keeping your plant alive as long as possible is important in order to fully mature the crop. And, I, and so I um, would hesitate to say cut water too early. That's a, a key piece. It's also ideal to water um, uh, with, with drip irrigation or bottom water toward the maturity uh, end of the crop. Because if you're watering with overhead and you have mature seed on the crop, you are subject to disease. You're subject to that seed, that mature seed getting on the crop, which is called vivipary, and the tendency toward that um, premature sprouting on the crop varies by crop and by variety. So this is a lettuce crop, and the lettuce crop is a great example of trying to capture the majority of your mature early seed and timing your harvest so that you're getting as much seed as possible, but it's nearly, it's nearly impossible to get all the seed because you've got maturation and stages. So this is the first stage when you see the flowering of the lettuce crop. And then you start to see some of that fluff. If you are a lettuce seed producer, you're familiar with this. This is what the plants look like when that first picture that Ms. Michaela showed a few slides ago about uh, the windblown seed. This is what it looks like on the plant. So you're starting to see that fluffing out, but this is still not quite ready to harvest. You still see a lot of green, you see a little bit of yellow, which are those flowers. And in lettuce, you can do multiple harvests. You can go along with a bucket or a bag and sort of bend the head of the plant over and shake it and get that mature seed to fall out. Each of those little fluffs is a little cup of seed. And as it matures and you start seeing that fluff, the cup opens a little bit, so the seeds will just dump right out. You can also do single harvests if you're doing a plot that's about this big, you probably don't want to go through with a bucket and do multiple collections on it. So you want to wait until you see something like this, where you've got really about 70, at least 70% of that fluff. You're starting the plants look a lot drier than they do in the previous picture. You'll notice there's no irrigation at this point. It's either been pulled or um, 
wasn't set up for drip, but this is what you want a lettuce crop to look like. So in general, if you're going to do a single harvest, I like to look for about 70% maturity across the, the field or the population that I'm going to harvest. And that's a 70% both on the individual plants and all of the plants in the field. So you want to take both of those into consideration. I think that's a good rule for a lot of crops too. If you think about um, losing 15% to uh, perhaps over mature seed and 15% to under mature seed, you're, you're um, doing well if you're capturing that bulk of the crop. Other crops, um, have, each crop has its own indicators of maturity and uh, in crops the timing of maturity is really going to vary across the population as you can see in this broccoli photo there's some heads that are fully flowered out and there's some heads that are still emerging and again as Lori was saying you can go through and selectively harvest the most mature plants and do repeat harvests or you can find that window of opportunity where you've got the bulk of the field ready and take it all at once and in a lot of crops, it's the color that you're looking for on the plant. In this case, these are still in the flowering stage and clearly not ready for mature. And if you look at this photo, the color of this is a brassica stalk that uh, this gentleman's holding up. And you can see um, the green in the stem is still there, but the, but the pods, uh, the salix of the plant, <laughs> are beginning to turn yellow and turn to brown. And that color is one of the most significant indicating factors in a lot of the vegetable, dry seeded vegetable crops. And I'm going to go back to this slide to make one more point. You can also make selection if you've got variable flowering time or maturity time. If you want to push for an earlier maturing seed crop or a later maturing seed crop or kind of right in the middle of that bell curve, you can selectively harvest seed from those plants or you can selectively harvest from the point in time where you've kind of got your peak maturation and you don't want necessarily to harvest from the outer edges, from the plants that aren't maturing or have matured really quickly. So as well as judging when you want to do your peak harvest over the whole population, you can also make selection while you're determining your, your harvest time as well. This is another way to sort of um, force maturity or push maturity along. You can undercut other crops. This is beans. So undercutting the plants keeps the plants in the field and allows them some more maturity time to fully develop as much seed as possible on the plant without pulling them out of the ground. Yes, yeah, so as we keep mentioning, each crop has its own indicators. This is an example of onion flowers, and you can see there's still flowers and not um, fully mature seed on this photo. Uh, the the umbel on the or uh, um, the the seed head on the bottom has a little bit more mature. You can see that they're in a fruiting stage there, as opposed to the open flowers on the flower stalk that's on the top. And what you're really looking for with onions is when you start to see those little um, uh, seed uh, heads, what do you call them, what are they called, fruits essentially, start to open up and you can see the black seed, those black spots in the center are actually the onion seed. And if you wait too long, they will begin to shatter, they will shatter out in the field. But this is a good indicator when you start to see the sign of a plant maturing enough to, to open and release the seed, then um, if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, it wouldn't do that if the seed was not yet mature. So it's a good indicator that it's time to go ahead and harvest and, um, and remember that after harvest, uh, the rest of those pods will continue to mature for a little while. So it's a good indicator that it's far enough along that once you take those um, heads off of the plant, that the rest of them will open up and have mature seed as well. And, and two color things to note in this slide as well are the stems are turning from yellow to from green to yellow, an indication of maturity and dry down in the plant in general. And also, if you look at the pods or the those little cups, 
holding the seed. There, you can see a few in several of the heads in the photo that are just barely starting to crack open, and they're a little more brown than green. So those are two color indicators. Generally, yellows and browns indicate maturity, often changing from green to yellow or brown is a general indication of maturity across a lot of the seed crops. So this is a brassica plant. This is actually purple sprouting broccoli that I grew this year. And this is not an ideal situation. You don't want to harvest seed when it's green in general if you can avoid it. But if you're going to have some sort of a weather event, if you're going to get a lot of persistent rain or you're going to get um, frosts or snow or some sort of weather, critical weather event, hail, and you want to get a crop out of the field sooner than ideal, it can be okay to harvest green seed as long as the seed is fully mature. And there are a couple of indicators that will help you determine this. One is color. If you pop open a really young brassica silique, you'll notice that the seeds are actually kind of uh, translucent and they pop really easily if you pinch them between your fingernails. And whereas this seed is actually mature, it's not translucent, it's turned from a translucent sort of vibrant green to sort of a dull darker green. And if you were to take that seed and pop it between your fingernails, it's fairly hard. And in the grain crops, Keith and Sam can address this later, but you're kind of going from soft dough to what's after? Soft dough phase. Milk and then dough. Right, milk. It's like the milk stage and the dough stage. So as long as you've reached kind of that final stage, if you don't see color, that brown or yellow color in the pod or the seed, you can still get viable, um, fairly quality seed off of a plant in the green stage. Again, it's not ideal, but if you have some sort of weather event or critical uh, event coming, you can get it out of the field and dry it down and still get nice mature seed off of it. We're not going to cover wet seed harvest much today. We're going to focus more on the dry seeds and the grains. But the one thing to know about harvesting any wet seed, that being seed inside of a fruit, is you want to wait until that fruit is at full maturity. For tomatoes, for example, that's pretty much at the eating stage. But for the cucurbits, like the, um, the squashes and the cucumbers, the fruit will actually look pretty different at the full maturity stage than it will at the eating stage. This is a cucumber turning from uh, yellow green to this nice burnished orange and that uh, color indicator that it's reached its full maturity and also it's much bigger in size than it is when we'd harvest it for the eating stage. So once you've determined that your crop is ready to be harvested, um, we're going to shift now to talk a little bit about how you would go about that harvest. And Lori and I are going to speak a little more to the hand, uh, uh, hand harvesting techniques and then turn it over to Keith and Sam to talk about how you would do the same thing with larger pieces of equipment. So as we mentioned uh, several times, you have some options of going out if you're on a small scale and selectively cutting individual plants as they're prime for harvest or, or cutting portions of the plant if they're prime for harvest. And then there are other instances if it's larger scale, it's more common in a production in um, scale uh, seed crop to go out and harvest the entire plant. And um, keep in mind that when you harvest the entire plant, the plant is, uh, will likely still continue to mature a certain amount after harvest. So this is also where um, it may not be that much more beneficial to leave it standing and harvest individual stalks off of a plant if you can harvest the whole thing and let it um, cure afterwards and um, continue maturing. So you can either uh, cut the entire plant at the base and then we will show you what you do with the plant after that. Or if you have a crop that is not quite mature, um, some farmers feel, and it's, uh, I've heard many debates in the field, um, but if you pull up the entire plant, so you still have that root mass um, attached to the plant, theoretically more of that energy from the root mass, the um, carbohydrates and reserves that are in that root will continue to feed the crop um, and continue that maturity a little bit longer. And if you do that, one thing you want to be very careful of is however you lay it out after that for 
drying and finishing to mature, you want to make sure that you're not getting the soil and the dirt that's still on that root ball on whatever tarp or landscape fabric or cloth that you're laying and collecting your seed on. And if you have a crop that is highly subject to shattering, it is also common to walk through the field and, and sequentially um, harvest from open, mature uh, seed heads just by carrying a bucket through the field and shaking those seed heads into the bucket. So this is a good uh, technique, particularly for some of the ornamental flowers and um, non-agronomic, non-vegetable crops um, that tend to shatter very readily. So as I mentioned earlier, we're not really going to cover wet seeded crops today, but this is a a slide just to give you some major points on what you're going to do with the dry seeded and wet seeded crops. And you're going to harvest the dry seeded crops much like you'd harvest grains, so generally a single harvest. And these are crops that like it dry, they need low humidity environments which helps control disease because they're quite susceptible to disease at maturity because they're what we refer to often as naked seed, where the seed doesn't have a lot of protection from the plant when it's at maturity. Lettuce is a great example of that. The seed is held in the little cup I was talking about earlier, but essentially it's naked and uh, open to the environment, and which makes it very vulnerable and susceptible. Most crops produce a plant hormone that causes short-term dormancy at maturity while it's still on the plant. So if, um, and, but each crop varies in the tendency to, um, to have that uh, dormancy while at, at early maturation. And that dormancy is um, a protection for the plant to avoid that sprouting while it's still imbibing water and sprouting while it's still on the plant. But again, as Lori was saying, you have seed that's um, fully mature and dry seed that's exposed to the environment. So if you have a lot of rain, um, an inclement weather, that seed can be subject to both disease and to sprouting on the plant. And so um, it's also important to keep in mind, you will learn over time that you may want to, har you may want to plant your crops sequentially to avoid all of your seed crops maturing all at once in the field. And if you're going into the fall and you have a lot of seed crops out in the field, times where you have to make some tough decisions about which ones to harvest um, first and which ones to save. Um, and to help you go through that thought process, I think it's valuable to consider which crops out there will survive even if you don't do anything during inclement weather. And if, seed is, if a crop has seed set but it's less mature, then it's much more tolerant of getting a little bit wet and then drying out again. So it may not hurt for it to go through a rain period if there's seed set on the, on the plant, but it's not so dry and mature that it's going to be subject to sprouting. And then there are crops that won't survive no matter what you do. If it's really that far along and you've got a lot of disease on it, it may be better for you to sacrifice that crop and save some of the other crops in the field that still have a chance. And then there are those that will survive if you make an effort. So we're going to talk a, a little bit in a moment here about what some of those efforts might be. But essentially, once you cut the plant, you cut that entire plant, as we were saying, it's going to continue maturing, and it allows you to get it out of the field and push that um, maturation process and put it somewhere where it's protected. And um, this is a photograph of a windrow, which essentially is cut plants that are now drying on a tarp. And, um, and when you have them in a long windrow like this, it's good to think about that crop now drying down. You want to turn those piles frequently, make sure that they're not um, uh, moist and rotting in the bottom of that pile. Flip them around each day if you can. This is um, geotextile fabric that this crop is laid out on, which is a porous material that allows water to, go ahead, that allows water to um, pass through the, the material and so it doesn't puddle. If you get a little bit of dew or moisture on, on top of a plastic tarp, you will likely have puddling at the surface where the uh, seed crop is touching the tarp. And uh, go ahead. I'm going to 
same so, thing as <clears throat> this is the same thing. This is just a windrow of lettuce, and this is pulling up the plants as we were mentioning earlier, and making sure that those root balls are off the tarp or off the landscape fabric in this case and the plant is on it. This is uh, Frank Morton's crew of Wild Garden Seed. This is many years ago, and I was just recently told they actually do not do this anymore. They don't pull them up and deal with the root ball. They just cut them at the soil surface. So this is still a hand technique, and it's a fairly, this is a fairly large uh, lettuce production here. So you can do a lot by hand on, on a hand scale. This is a close-up picture of that geotextile fabric. Uh, it's sometimes called landscape fabric. It can be a little challenging to find, but it's a wonderful thing to use if you are doing hand harvest techniques. It's a poly spun fabric, so it is porous and breathable, but you can see in the picture on the left, that's the fabric pulled back over the top of a windrow and it's shedding water. So that was protection against a rain event. And you can see on the right hand side, that's the lettuce windrow that has been covered and protected, and that's now nice and dry. And as you, if you can remember back to those slides we started with with the lettuce, once you pull them up or, or cut them and lay them on the fabric and let them dry for probably a week or two, depending on your weather conditions and how mature the plants were to start with, you'll see almost 100%, probably mm -hmm. at least 90% of that fluffing out, and you'll get a lot, a nice, a lot of nice mature seed off of it. Uh, this is kind of a fun technique that our researcher, Jared Zeistro, who's our California specialist, used in cutting some very tall quinoa that was difficult to harvest, and he decided to use a chainsaw. So this is an, just a, a slide to show you that being creative in your seed harvests and being flexible and adaptable to what's going on in the field and what you have to deal with each year is a critical part of being a seed producer. And sometimes you'll find tools that are absolutely not necessarily specific to seed production and seed harvest that are very useful. I've seen this done on radish too. If you, if you think about the size of, the, of, a, of a fully mature vegetable seed plant, it is often quite woody at the base and can be pretty difficult to cut in the, you know, with big clippers or something. So, um, not that uncommon, actually. <laughs> be, be open to experimentation. So we're going to talk through some equipment and sort of large, larger scale harvesting here. Mostly this is going to involve combining and swathing. This is a picture of Sam swathing buckwheat out at Nash's. So swathing is essentially the same as if you went through and cut all of those plants. Um, before you did the, the cleaning and combining. Now put them into windrows. This is a, just a close-up picture. This is Keith Sw Swather, and he may... Sure, yeah. So uh, a swather essentially is, is cutting the crop, and it's not doing any threshing. It's simply cutting the crop and, and piling it into a windrow in the middle of the machine, and then and then the crops allowed to lay in the field and, and dry down and then <clears throat> come back through with a combine to actually thresh the crop after it's dried. So swathing is a technique you only want to use on crops that don't have a really, uh, that aren't super apt to shatter out. Like you would never swath lettuce because you would lose a whole bunch of seed. But you swath crops like buckwheat and chard. Or, I mean, you can yeah, you can do chard and, and some of the brassicas. The most probably <clears throat> the most common piece of equipment in um, seed harvest is our combines, and we'll show you a couple scales of combines. This is a combine out at Nash's, and this is a beet crop. And here are some close-ups of what that combine looks like. So combine is called a combine because it combines cutting and threshing all in one pass across the field. And I let Sam explain how it works a little bit. The the first part of a combine, the head, I got the the platform with your cutter bar and your reel that sort of looks like a windmill. And there's this the the picture in front of you is a grain head. That's more for cutting the crop and bringing it in to the auger that then uh, 
takes it up the the snout into where the cylinder and concave is. You could have uh, that's where the threshing is done. Very very violent aggressive uh, area of the machine. You can increase this the the cylinder is the rotating part and the concave is the held part and you have a spike tooth cylinder which is many teeth rotating in between other teeth or rasp bar which is a grooved bar that uh, rubs up against the, the the chaff and the straw and the seed and the material and pretty much at, at that in that area of the machine you can increase or decrease the speed of the cylinder and you can increase and decrease the gap in between the rotating cylinder and the held rasp bar and that is that can make a huge difference in if you have it too tight or too fast you can actually burn seed you could burn carrot seed and knock the germ completely out of it if it's a, a, a pea and you have it too tight you can you can make a bunch of pea flour really quick so um, that's your first area of the machine that that's really important to, to, to understand and play around with uh, this is the cylinder a spike two cylinder the rasp bar is taken out and all of the material underneath the cylinder is bull's blood beet seed and this field was really wet it was taken with a grain platform because at that point we did not have a swather or a pickup head and a lot of times you don't have the machinery you need but you still need to get the crop done and it's uh, it, it's a continual process um, but don't don't let that don't let that stop you um, so right here this this represents um, dealing with machinery. Uh, hand harvesting is is a very effective uh, clean method that you have a lot of control over. Um, once you get into larger quantities you, you really got to get into s some large-scale machinery and at that point you got to be mechanical um, or you're going to lose your crop. So behind this uh, spike tooth cylinder all, all the material gets chopped up. The seed then falls into the augers um, below this in this picture and and the straw goes behind the cylinder and up through a series of, of, of straw walkers and so the straw gets walked out the back of the machine and any seed left in the straw falls down down into the straw walkers into other augers and the augers, those augers and the augers in this picture take it up to two sieves, which are essentially uh, uh, adjustable screens. Um, and your your top sieve, you want to set the opening of it to to accept in your target seed and and material smaller than your target seed and and. And, and the size of, of around your target seed. At the same time, there is air blowing through those sieves, which is blowing out smaller material and almost everything up to the weight of your target seed. And then, so that material falls through the top sieve onto your second sieve. And that's, that sieve is, is opened, uh, um, open to the point where you want your target seed to fall through it anything that's questionable will stay on that sieve and be shaken and blown into an auger that is your secondary auger which will essentially take all that questionable material that you've set the machine to question back up and drop it right back in this spot where this picture is and it will get a second chance to rotate through and then all the target seed will fall through that bottom sieve and go and get elevated up into your grain tank into your payload tank you might um, there's many different settings for different seeds and different uh, different uh, 
different needs. You might set your your bottom sieve so tight that you're actually using the machine to maybe deburr, defer carrot seed. You got to be really careful not to burn that carrot seed, but you might you might make it go through several times in process. Um, you might it might not be a very valuable crop. You just want the largest best seed. So you might set your air up so high to where you're actually blowing good seed out the back, but it's not, uh, so you're going for barley and you just want big, big seed stalks or it's a holeless barley and you have some holes on there that catch the wind. So you're gonna set your wind speed up really high um, and just capture what you want. So you can, you can do a lot of seed cleaning inside your combine and it, it just depends on the value of that seed and whether you want quantity or quality. Right here, we're using an old 1970s John Deere 95 combined in some barley, some feed barley. Um, in this circumstance, this is just going to be hog feed and chicken feed. So you you might set it so loose to where you're accepting in all your weed seed, all your little barley, um, and you're just you're just going for quantity here. So combines come in all sizes, and you've probably seen some of those massive photos of combining mm -hmm. soybeans across the Midwest that are, you know, a quarter acre wide or so it seems to be. Um, this is a picture of a plot combine, and for small scale vegetable growers, this is an invaluable tool. They're also fairly expensive. I think they cost around twenty-five thousand dollars, what I've heard. Um, but if there's, if you have any access to borrowing one, they're very common with university research plots. This is an example of a, a research plot of quinoa that's plot combined, so that you can harvest on a small scale. Essentially, it works the same way. And we have a short video to show you of, of this machine actually working that Alice is going to set up for us. One thing I want you to note is that um, the head is adjustable height and he's adjusting it as he goes because the quinoa he's harvesting is not all the same height. So he's adjusting it to get the optimal amount of seed as he goes through each plot. And the person on the back is sitting there with uh, the collection, the bag collection, and the reason, because they're doing small plots of multiple different breeding populations or varieties, that person is back there to change out the bags frequently and make sure that they're capturing the seeds separately. This is another example of a small small to medium scale combine. This is a grain combine. I believe this is a wheat crop. So very similar to that plot combine. Um, nice for, area, for uh, acreages that are a little too big to do by hand, but not big enough that you need a huge combine. This is a 19, I don't know, late 40s to 50s case in case pole type combine. It does not have a cutter head on it. And right here, your the, the crop was small enough to where a large combine, it would have taken the whole crop just to charge a large combine so you could then tune it and 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 know where your settings are. Um, so here it's uh this was hand swathed. Um, it's cabbage cabbage. Uh, I think I think that's car Columbia green summer cabbage. And so it's it's hand swathed, mechanically dried. So everything is dried and cured to what I call the same the same age the same stage. And then this this pole type combine has a draper head, which is a big belt, and a bunch of fingers that bring it up into the belt and take it into the the spike two cylinder. And all these combines, all these machines, are the the same basic principles with threshing, shaking, screening, and blowing wind through them. And it's it, it's it's important to understand how basic that principle is and whether you have a half a million dollar combine or a old five gallon bucket and a box fan, uh, you, you can still accomplish the same principle. 
um, it, it just depends on 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 your your equipment, your your experience, and and how big and valuable your crop is. This is a picture of an all crop. It's a piece of equipment that um, can commonly be found used and. Uh, Essentially, this is a piece that you can use for threshing after harvest, just as Sam was picking up that crop in the field. You can hand feed it into the all crop and um, and it'll do the threshing and spit out the, the um, seed will drop through the bottom and it's adjustable uh, in terms of size and wind, just as, as Sam was saying with the combine and the larger pieces of um, chaff will come out the, the back of it. Great. Uh, so yeah, my name's Keith, and on our farm we grow uh, a variety of crops, uh, mostly crops that we direct combine, uh, with the exception of the buckwheat that we have to swath beforehand to, to let it dry down, and there are exceptions to even that crop being direct combined um, when conditions aren't correct. Uh, so this is a, a, a wheat crop or barley crop. And in this photo, you can see that the crop is really nicely dried down. It's nice and uniform. There's not some of the seed heads or the stalks that are green. It's all pretty darn ripe. And um, we spend a lot of time watching the crop and looking for the, the, the color to change from the green to the more golden color. And we also spend a fair bit of time walking the field and threshing the grain <clears throat> in our hands and kind of performing, you know, chewing tests on them to see how crunchy the seeds are, or uh, in some cases, trying to use your fingernail to see if you can dent the seed. And <clears throat> you can also just get a feel for the humidity in the field and, and just how it feels walking through it, how ripe it is and how ready it is to harvest. This is a rye vetch crop, um, direct combined. The black uh, dark seeds there are the vetch, and the kind of greenish gray uh, are the rye, of course. Um, so that's pre-cleaning, nothing's been sorted out, it hasn't been graded uh, or anything. Uh, this is a hard red winter crop, uh, wheat crop, and um, you can just see that it's a, a nice red color, uh, hard, really crunchy in the mouth, and uh, a quite easy crop to, to thresh. Uh, this is a barley crop and <clears throat> as Sam mentioned earlier, if the cylinder uh, isn't set correctly on the combine, you get some cracking and you can see some of the seeds are cracked uh, in this photo. Um, not too concerned about it. Sometimes you get a pretty varied size of seed uh, when you're combining, so you end up losing some of it out the back of the combine because it's lighter, or if you've set the sieve such to run it through the machine again, um, you're cracking some of the larger seeds or cracking because your cylinder speed is too fast. Here are some different photos of uh, quinoa in varied um, degrees of growth. The top left you can see uh, <clears throat> certainly not ready to harvest yet, still green, just starting to turn color. Um, going down to the bottom right, uh, you can see the crop is fairly well dried down. It's pretty brown and um, looking pretty close to harvest. And then on the left bottom, you can see, um, if you look closely, you can see some of the seeds are starting to sprout and it's kind of funky colors and there it might be some mold maybe starting. Uh, so that crop has been standing possibly in the field for too long. This is a perfectly ripe uh, head of quinoa and when you rub this through your hand it threshes very very easily and you can kind of winnow it in the field and, <clears throat> and look at it in your hand and, and get a sense for the timing of the harvest. This is a seed head that has been threshed in my hand and is, I think, starting to show some signs of mold. It's certainly not ready to harvest. Um, the seeds are really spongy uh, and the red sections there are just not dried down areas of the seed head. And so they're still holding on the seed and you can't really thresh those out. 
this is a close-up view of, of quinoa that is just threshed in the field in my hand and showing uh, pretty uniform dryness and a nice even ripeness. Uh, this is showing quinoa up close, uh, straight out of the combine uh, in the drying bin. Uh, oftentimes we draw dry quinoa after harvest because we get so much green stalk uh, matter in the in the seed. Um, this is uh, another close-up slide of quinoa showing the <clears throat> volunteer buckwheat seed that ended up in that field. So early stages of the buckwheat uh, on the left there, the flowering stage, um, quinoa does not, or sorry, buckwheat does not ripen as uniformly as a lot of other crops. So we we uh, evaluate uh, how ripe the crop is, and there might be some percentage of the seed that is ripe and some percentage of the, the seed head that's not ripe. And you need to go through with a swather and swath it into a windrow and let those green seeds dry down. And this is a photo of a combine with a pickup head picking up the quinoa or the buckwheat after it's been in the windrow. This was kind of an emergency harvest of buckwheat, uh, direct combining it, very green. You can see the field is bright green. It should have been swathed, but we just didn't have the weather window for swathing it and then enough day, uh, dry days to let it dry down. So we direct combined it and then put it in the grain dryer to dry it up. Uh, this is buckwheat after the drying process. So again, Sam, Sam here with Nash Farms, and we've been growing seed for a long time, uh, 20, 20, 30 years. It really just the last 15 years or so, we've gotten more serious into it and larger scale um, beyond just saving a hand, couple handfuls of our own seed. Um, started out more with grains um, and got larger scale, got more equipment and learned quickly that the equipment is universal for your large faba beans all the way down to your small carrot seed, phacelia seed, and began to diversify more into to different crops and, and, and pick up different equipment. Um, we we started out pretty much just with a 1940 Massey Harris combine that uh, was really the inspiration to get more equipment actually. And um, this here is about two acres of of cauliflower. Um, cauliflower, very very valuable crop. Um, we've had we had trouble the last couple years getting uh, getting volume of seed. We had uh, pod weevils get in there and eat 90% of the seeds. So you want to tell us about how to harvest brassica crops in, in general? Um, don't, do they always have to be cut first before you combine them? Generally, with my experience, you, you want to swath all your, bra all your brassica crops. And what are the signs you look for to know when to do that swathing? So obviously, you know, your weather, um, brassica, most brassica crops in our climate come on pretty early, uh, as early as late June, early July to the 1st of September or so. So rain normally isn't a big issue for brassicas. Um, shattering can be a big issue. And because brassicas are such a high value, low yield, uh, Lower, lower yield, smaller seed. You're, you know, you're not bringing in tons and tons of it. You're bringing in pounds. So, so I can see that these brassica heads are completely brown when you're forking them into the combine. But what do they look like when you cut them? When you go in and do that swapping, what are the, what is, what are the indicators that it's time to do that? So, so typically, I'll cut, I'll swath, um, sort of what I call in the middle ground. And what I'm looking for walking through the crop is you got a large amount of seed that that is that's looking good. That's just it's going to start shattering in the next week or two, and then you have uh, maybe 10% of the crop that is already shattering, 
and then on the other on the other end you have 10 percent of the crop that's that's not ready it's still green and so when that's why you swath is to get all that seed to roughly the same age of maturity so i always i'm looking for that middle ground um uh, too early you're going to have low germination and you might have have a hard mildew issues or a hard time actually threshing it because it's still the, the pods are still green when you cut them so they're not going to open up as much too late obviously you're going to just shatter your whole crop and you're not going to get it into your machine so on brassicas we we still do a lot of hand harvesting and that comes down to you know, we'll, we'll hand harvest up to eighth of an acre, quarter of an acre of cabbage or kale seed. Um, it's not enough seed to process through a combine. And be, and because of the value, it's it's uh, we will actually take it, throw it into to bins and hand thrash it in the bins in the barn. Um, as long as it's stable and safe, we have so much stuff going on that time of year that we'll, we bring it in the barn and we deal with it later in the season. Um, this crop being two acres, that's that's way too much to hand harvest. So we hand and and the other thing about brassicas is you typically hand swath them, even these big two acre fields. Um, mechanical swathers, uh, unless you have a really nice one with all the bells and whistles, it's really hard not to not to shatter a large amount of crop with that machine. So here we've hand swathed. And now uh, this combine had the pickup head on it, and so we're driving uh, driving through the crop as Taylor and Chris here are pitchforking the the crop into it. Um, this is this is uh, collie seed, and it's the exact same field. And here we got our five gallon bucket and our fan behind in, in the background there. And this just sort of represents what you can do either in the machine or with your winnowing, with your box fan and five gallon bucket. Um, sometimes it's it's sometimes it's not important to grade the seed. Uh, sometimes you can you can be a little bit pickier. Say here, for example, we're going to get a small amount of really large seed in on, in the on the bottom right of this picture that we might save for our own stock seed. Um, the middle seed is we got a, a, a huge volume of that and that's going to be for sale or for our own production use and then in the top left pretty low germ um, you know maybe we'll maybe we'll run it through again or, or we might toss it um, but again you can you can do this with your box fan or if if you have a large volume and want to play around with with the machine you can you can actually do this with your sieves and your and your and your blowers um, this is me being really excited about growing some dent corn in western washington <laughs> this is year 3 of a breeding project i've been working on um, uh, this this is this is I think two years ago, and the crop dried down really well. Um, we got I got a, a a grain head that I'm combining corn with, um, which the guys in the Midwest I'm sure would be laughing at me. Looking up in the grain tank, you know that's some pretty clean looking corn coming through though. That's 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 so. This just shows, uh, you know, the the diversity of equipment. You always need more. I do not have a corn head. If, if anybody out there has a four row, uh, I think 400 series John Deere corn head, <laughs> let me know. But um, with the corn you're looking for, brown in the stalks, that the plant is dry enough that when you go through with that combine, that dry plant material will break up in the combine. You don't have moisture in the stalks that would get. Um, uh, tied up into in, in the vegetative material. Yeah, yeah. Here the corn the corn is dry. The plant matter going processing through the combine is 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 wetting the seed. So this year we actually did not need to dry it. Um, most years we this year will probably was not as hot as that year. So we probably will be combining this corn um, and drying it. Right. So right here with this grain head, 
probably a third of the crop as the reel, the, the, the reel on front rotates and brings the material into the cutter bar to get cut to then get brought up into the machine, that reel knocks about a third of the corn cobs off before they even get into the machine. And there's really nothing I can do about it. So we're just, but we are, we are, we're, we are bringing in corn. Here we got, uh, we got 10 acres of green field peas swathed. And you can see here, part of the crop is a nice tan brown dried down and then you got other areas where you got a gravelly gravelly bar going through or a, a, a wet low spot still pretty green um, so this is where swathing can really really change the game uh, make the difference between getting getting the majority of the crop into the machine um, and not having to use a dryer um, there was many years that we did not have a swather and we would combine this crop with a grain head um, and you're bringing in your 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 pulp the, the plants aren't cut by the swather so your reel on the combine is pulling up plants by the root bringing in small pebbles and small dirt clods which are the same size as the peas um, so the machine can't process can't tell the difference and even when you take it to the seed cleaners they sometimes have a hard time um, sorting the difference. So, um, so you're looking for a uniform brown field before you come back through this field with the combine. Yeah, you'll 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 walk through there. You'll pull the windrows up, um, and you want to you want to go look for a, the greenest spot in the field, um, and and look underneath the windrow and see if your if your pods are are shattering well. And then you also want to go to the driest spot of the field. And see if they have all shattered already, because that means you've you've gone you've gone you've waited too long. Okay. We're playing with some kidney beans here. Still haven't still haven't really got a good combine for for beans. Uh, they're a tough one. Uh, they just want to split. They say I heard I heard something in the seed industry. A two foot drop on these guys gives you twenty percent more shattering or something like that. Beans are just really hard to handle, but we uh, we like to eat a lot of kidneys, so we sort of do this for ourselves. So I've heard with um, seed crops that tend to split or shatter that it uh, is beneficial to, to combine then in the morning when there's a little bit of moisture so that the beans are less likely to, to break during the, the harvest process. Is that what you do? Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, you can, you know, normally we're always waiting for that dew to, to get off the grass before we take the machinery out there to combine, but a little bit of moisture will help. Um, for example, uh, chard and beets, um, although you never want them to get rained on after they've been swathed, a little bit of rain could actually help them break off the stalk. A, a little bit of rain will hurt, whereas brassicas, a little bit of rain after they've been swathed, we'll, we found we'll, we'll make them shatter more easily. So we're going to just spend a few minutes here going over some of the post-harvest drying. We've gone over a lot of these concepts already, but hopefully as you've picked up either windrowing or swathing, helps to complete maturity, helps to dry the plant down so it's easier to thresh and clean when everything's dry and breaks free. And you can do this both out or you can bring the crop into a covered area. Some covered areas are a greenhouse. This is on Rime and that geotextile fabric. This is a Swiss chard crop that we grew this year. This is hand harvested, kind of a small lot. And this is an even smaller lot. These are different breeding lines of tomatoes. Those are window screens and a little greenhouse, fans on it to keep airflow going. So each of those screens has four different breeding lines. This is a way to dry down very small lots of seed. If you have a high tunnel or a greenhouse, you can dry down in there. Again, I don't recommend using tarps for drying down, even if you're in a covered space, because dew can collect on the tarp on the plant and in the morning. And then you get little puddles, and throughout the day, you can actually end up with rotten plant matter and rotten seed. So I recommend not using tarps if you have another option. 
Another option is using your tables in your greenhouse. These are actually covered with sheets, cotton sheets that this uh, woman acquired from Goodwill, which gives some breathability and also allows her to collect any of the seed that drops off as it dries down. Uh, screen tables are another option. These are pretty low-tech screen tables. They're stackable, which can be really helpful for using your space efficiently, easy to build, useful for a lot of things. Obviously, these are a couple different lots, different kinds of corn. This is a bin dryer that Sam built out at Nash's, and Keith just built a bin dryer this year as well, so I'm going to hand it back over to them to talk a little bit more about bin dryers. This is from larger scale, larger lots of things where you're bringing it in from the field and it's not quite as dry as you want. You've combined it and then you need a way to dry down large volumes of seed. So in these pictures you can see we've got <clears throat> large uh, fans that blow a pretty good volume of air up through the bottom of these boxes. These boxes are plywood four by four by four feet in diameter <clears throat> or square and the bottoms are screened so we've got a heat source and a fan blowing air up through the bottoms. They all sit on a on a larger plenum box where the air flows uh, through the bottom and allows the ventilation through the top of the box. So you can see the screen on the bottom, heavy duty screen, uh, two or three layers of screen, large, large diameter holes all the way up to window screen to keep seeds like quinoa from falling through. And all these bins are forkliftable onto the box. This is a <clears throat> this is a grain uh, moisture meter. So when you're bringing crops in out of the field, you put the grain in this cup, and it has a digital readout, and it tells you the the moisture level. So if you're starting at 18 or 20 percent from the field, you put it in the grain dryer and blow the the hot air through it and dry it down to your desired moisture level. So for us, for grains, we're typically trying to target 11, 12, 13 percent for long-term storage. I'm going to bring us back a couple of slides mm -hmm. here to the bin dryer shed that Sam built. And I want to point out, Keith mentioned you can stack these boxes. I think you can stack the bins three or four high in this design. So I'm going to let Sam tell you a little bit about this shed that he built and then we'll break for questions and we'll have about 20 to 25 minutes for your questions. So this dryer holds four bins on the, the first one here, uh, obviously missing. Uh, the basic principle is just a plenum or a manifold that has, uh, this one has four openings on it. Um, and then a, a really powerful fan that can pressurize that plenum and force it through the seed with also uh, adding propane as your, your heat drying source or sometimes even on a, uh, a late August, September day, you can just run it with, uh, with a low humidity, high, high afternoon temperature. Uh, this dryer, each of these bins holds about 2,500 pounds, so we can dry up to five ton of four of up to four different varieties of seed, or as little as maybe 500 to 1,000 pounds is what it takes to charge it, or else you're going to be blowing blowing seed all over. Um, so pretty 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 easy principle to wrap your head around. The the, the important thing. The useful thing about a dryer is it can buy you time. And in a harvest season where you have two, three, four dozen different kinds of crops, uh, different varieties of crops coming in, and you have a two to three week harvest window, you just don't, you can do the math. You don't have enough time to do all of that and clean your combines out so you're not contaminating one seed lot with another. So early on in the season, we try not to jump the gun too much, but we start looking around. Is there anything that's going to buy us some time so we can, uh, you know, focus more on some of the specialty crops or the difficult crops or, or even start building your harvest cushion in case you have breakdowns, uh, need a couple days for repairs or ordering parts, or in case that unexpected uh, rainstorm comes through and it just shuts you down. So time is very important that time of year. Did you want to mention how the drying um, moves from the bottom to the top of the bin and that temperature shift that you're explaining and the fact that you want to 
once you start drying, you've got to finish drying. So on the, so on a plenum dryer, it's not rotating the seed like a big batch dryer. So you're you're taking uh, say that moisture level is at 20 percent. You're going to start drying the bottom layer, and you're pushing that moisture up. So as it dries, there's going to be a high moisture band that is working its way up through from the bottom of the bin to the top. And so your moistures might go higher than that original 20 percent. And it's important that you keep it drying and you dry it as fast as you can, or that moisture band will sprout that seed or mold that seed as it's working its way up through the top to the top. Okay, um, great. This is Alice. Um, we do have a question about what temperature um, should be in the bin dryer. So ours has a, 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 a control thermostat on it that uh, was not functioning properly. So we we put it on a manual. Uh, it's actually we we run it on the on the gauge of the the propane gauge um, the the uh, regulator. And so we're running about 75 to 85 degrees, uh, which takes something from about tw takes about five ton, 20 percent moisture down to say 11, 12 percent moisture in eight to 12 hours, burning maybe three to five, five to eight gallons of propane. Okay, thank you. If you have general questions about organic farming that don't have to do with seeds, um, you can use the e-extension Ask an Expert. But right now we have time for additional questions about this topic. So we're getting some already. So um, we have a question about uh, the best way to protect seeds in the field from birds. This is Lori. I'll respond to that. Um, I had a lot of experience working with Frank Morton Wild Garden Seed where we did a lot of lettuce. And what we did is that picture we saw earlier about the windrow and having the, the lettuce, two rows of lettuce sort of facing each other on the geotextile fabric. And we found if we put the heads so that they were touching each other but not overlapping, that we lost a lot less seed to birds, that they could get to the very top layer for predation, but they couldn't actually get to the plants below. And we would stack those up maybe three to five plants high, depending on the variety and depending on how big the heads were. Um, you can also, with that geotextile fabric, because it's breathable, you can either take a second piece and pull it over the top, or you can pull out a piece that's twice as long as you need and fold it back over the top of that windrow, and that also offered a fair bit of bird protection. Um, it's really a risk management and minimizing your loss, because there wasn't, if you're going to dry it in the field, there's no way to eliminate loss to birds, but those were the two ways we found to be most helpful. Okay, there's a little bit of confusion about geotextile fabric. Is that the same thing as row cover, or is it something more specific? It's very similar to row cover, uh, made out of the same material, but it's a little thicker and more durable than what we would commonly call Rime by brand name. And if you do an online search for geotextile fabric, it's also called landscape fabric because it's also used as a weed barrier sometimes. So it is the same material but thicker, and the Rime will really rip very quickly if used for holding seed crops. It can be used in a pinch, but it's much more delicate. Okay, great. That's helpful. And let me follow up just a quick bit, Alice, on that. The geotextile fabric I have actually found from um, the forestry industry more than I have from the agricultural industry. And it's important that it's a polyspun um, fabric, whereas a lot of the landscape you get is a woven plastic fabric, and that's not what you're looking for. Okay, great. Um, all right, so we have some questions about um, seed size. So for a plant like broccoli, how significant is seed size for the vigor of the plant that grows from that seed? I know Sam referred to that on his part. Does it really matter? Once a plant starts growing, don't the growing conditions override any seed size benefits? Can someone talk about that? The size of the seed is um, going to be uh, in indicative of how much um, energy is retained in that seed. So larger size seed will store longer in storage and it will have a higher uh, potentially then over time because it is it's got more reserves to feed on as it's in storage will have a longer storage time 
as well as when it's planted, have more energy for that emerging cotyledon to feed off of. So in general, larger seed is more vigorous and stores longer. Smaller seed will also grow, and um, if you're not storing something for a long period of time, then there's, there's nothing wrong with that. You want to add anything, Sam? But it, it is a generality that larger seed is what we would consider higher quality seed. And in fact, when you buy seed from uh, a seed company, they often size the seed so that there's uh, uniformity in the size of seed they're selling to you for planting purposes so that it fits into um, mechanical planters more easily. But also that larger size seed is going to ensure that it's a higher quality seed. Okay, yeah, this is kind of a relevant, a related question. Um, someone was asking whether or not you can harvest the leaves of lettuce and then later let the plant go to seed and then use the seed. I mean, are you then, if you cut off a lettuce head, are you then pretty much ruining your chances of that first flush of very vigorous seed? Or do you know if people do this? Uh, you can cut leaves off of it. It's not recommended. You are taking energy away from the plant, which, you know, to some degree, it may be minor depending on how much you take off, will probably affect the quality and amount of seed you get. You certainly don't want to cut the entire head. If you cut the entire head, um, you, you've cut the growing point and you're not going to get uh, any seed off of it because it's not going to throw up a bolting stock. Um, Ideally, you would grow out enough leaves that you can harvest whatever you need for your own personal use or your farm, however you sell or distribute your produce. And then you leave the plants alone that you want to save the seed from and you don't harvest anything from them. That is the ideal. It's a question that often comes up with gardeners that have a small space and want to be able to eat and save some seed at the same time. And certainly you can do that. Once you move into commercial seed production, it's um, not recommended in terms of focusing that crop on the quality and quantity of seed that you're, that you're going to harvest. At the same time, you can also uh, plant many seed crops at a closer spacing and harvest the uh, less desirable looking plants and leave the um, most desirable looking plants at a wider spacing for eventual seed production and in that way still harvest some vegetable production off of the same plot that you might be growing for seed, if that makes sense. Okay, um, back to the temperature in the drying bins. Is there a maximum temperature for drying seed? Yeah, I think there would be. Um, as high, I mean, it, uh, it would be more of a question whether you're burning it. Um, the the problem with a with a with a plenum dryer is you're not rotating the seed, so you do want to force air through it, not too cool, or you're just wasting your time and money, and not too hot, so you're not burning the bottom seed, and and, and getting an uneven dry. When, when we're drying at, say, 85 degrees, the bin being four foot cubed, the bottom is, say, 11%, and we know the top's going to be 13 or 14%. So then when we go take that to the bin dump and dump it, it mix itself and average, averages itself out. Um, if it's feed, Barley for hog feed, say it really doesn't matter. You could, you know, you can knock the germ out of it. Um, not a big deal. I'm gonna follow that up a little bit. Um, OSA has a number of publications on our website. One of which is a weather-related risk reduction guideline. They're all free. You just have to enter your email address and you get a link, and you can download them as many times as you want. And some of the information we've talked about today is covered specifically in that guide, and there are uh, other guides that will give you more crop-specific information and some other general information. Um, but as a general rule, temperatures above 90 degrees are kind of a tipping point for damaging seed. And if you're trying to dry seed too quickly and you're trying to use high heat to dry it quickly, you can actually um, get hardened the outside of the seed coat because it'll dry really fast, and then the inside of the seed 
actually stays moist. And then that moisture can't escape because you've dried the outside to such a hard shell. And you can lose and lose quality, lose germination, and damage and or kill your seed that way. So ideally, like Sam was saying earlier, 75 to 85 degrees is a, a desirable temperature range. And you really don't want to dry, you don't want to try and dry your seed crop um, fast and hot. And that air circulation is facilitating the drying as much as the temperature. Okay. Um, do you have any tips for the fastest way to harvest pole beans, um, whether um, someone should do it by hand or whether it's better to harvest the entire plant? <laughs> We're laughing because Keith said use a chainsaw. Um, <laughs> pole beans are a challenging crop. Um, I do know a commercial pole bean grower. And I think that he hand harvests, if I am not incorrect. I think that you could also, um, uh, at a certain point in time, um, pull the entire plant or cut the entire plant at the base and put it out on a tarp and let it finish maturing and drying on the tarp and then thresh it that way. Um, I don't have a definitive answer, which is, I guess, the tarp way would be faster. How much loss you incur in that process is the question. And of course, pole beans ripen sequentially because they're indeterminate. So at any given time, you have some immature pole bean seed and some mature pole bean seed likely on the same plant. Um, so cutting it and drying it would be the fastest, but you would that would probably you know be at, at uh, some level of yield reduction. Okay, um, here's a question for crops that take that I take clones of for our own production, like potatoes or garlic. Is it ever necessary to do a round of growing from seed to prevent accumulation of bad mutations or just reinvigorate the crops with more genetic variation? Well, as, as a commercial producer, I, I would say no, but certainly, um, seed of those crops is utilized to induce um, new genetic variation from a plant breeding process. But um, I believe we have some other webinars on the topic of plant breeding, and, and it might be a topic more appropriate to answer there. I'll see if, if Lori has a, a shorter question a little bit off of the harvest issue. Yeah, my general response would be for disease, yes. For increasing and maintaining diversity, no, because those are clonal crops. Okay. Um, we do have a huge archive of other webinars for anyone that doesn't know that already on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you just Google eOrganic YouTube, you can find a very large number of webinars on organic seed production and breeding. So I would recommend anybody um, who's interested to take a look there because there are lots of treasures. Um, okay, so we have some additional question here. Um, what seeds need to be treated like tomato seeds, um, in other words, have a fermentation process? In my experience, and I honestly don't have a tremendous amount of experience with these crops, so I'll let Michaela chime in here as well. Tomatoes and cucumbers are benefit most from fermentation. Tomatoes, I would say, are pretty critical to ferment. Otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of energy trying to get that gel placental coating off, which is important to do because that coating has anti-germination factors. Uh, we will talk about this in the next webinar as well. Um, people do ferment melon seeds, squash seeds, and pepper seeds, sometimes fermenting, sometimes just soaking to help with release of the flesh and tissue around it. But the critical factor for cucumbers and tomatoes is actually breaking down that placental tissue, which is uh, absolutely necessary. Okay, um, someone has a question about corn. Um, in a short season area, do you just take the ears at the normal harvest time, or at what point do you harvest corn for seed? Uh, harvesting, we normally go through the entire crop and hand harvest um, the the ears with the ears from the plants and the ears that have the our desired traits as our seed stock. Um, 
and then go through and combine the entire crop for for corn to be ground into cornmeal or or or, or chicken feed. What are the indicators on the corn that you're looking for to know that it's mature enough seed and dry enough seed to go ahead and harvest it up a viable corn? Okay. Um, in Western Washington, you know, it's not corn country. So as we're walking through, as we're walking through the crop, um, we're looking for those plants that are showing early maturity, um, full full ears. Uh, looking for a small cob with a small cob to seed ratio, um, straight rows, uh, you know, all the all, all the desired traits to a, to a beautiful head and an early maturing, healthy plant, uh, good, good, good strength, uh, you know, not too tall, not too short, all those traits. But what about the seed itself? Is, do you do a bite test? Do you do a thumb test to see whether that seed is mature enough and hard enough? That is obviously out of the milk stage, out of the starch stage. When is that seed hard enough that it's going to be viable? So I've done a little bit of sweet corn um, seed production, and we look for the wrinkling in the corns, in the cob. Ideally, all the kernels on the cob would sort of wrinkle and shrink on the plant before you take it off, but sometimes we don't have a long enough season for that. So I have been told uh, by one of our colleagues who is a sweet corn breeder that as long as you start seeing wrinkling in the kernels, you're pretty, you're safe to harvest and then dry. You need to bring those ears in and shuck them and dry them, uh, preferably with warmth and air circulation. But ideally, you leave it in the field until you see a lot of shrinkage and wrinkling. Uh, if you can't do that, you bring it in and dry it. At, you need to at least see some wrinkling in the kernels. I, I think what, what's throwing me off is we do dent corn and sweet corn seed, and you would treat them both very differently. The dent corn is going to dry on the plant, and it's going to be rock hard. The sweet corn in our climate, you you need to go out there and pull it off and and either bring it into your house or a drying room or put it on a dryer or it will mold out on the on the crops. Okay, um, I don't know if this is a question for Keith or um, anyone with experience. Um, someone is looking for even more general tips for small scale grain harvest and storage. Uh, in terms of resources, um, Organic Seed Alliance, of course, is a good resource. Uh, Washington State University, um, that's where I would start in terms of resources for growing grain in your, uh, I guess it depends on where you are, obviously. Um, and talking to farmers around you uh, that are maybe in the business of growing grain and, and on the scale that you're interested in. Okay, I think that was it for the questions. We had one question I didn't quite understand. I'll ask it anyway in case someone else is a little bit, under, might understand what this person means, but I did ask for some clarification. When harvesting for seed, how does harvesting plants that have developed woody stems impact your soil quality? So does that make sense? Um, I'm wondering if that means do you want to leave the stems out in the field after you've harvested or threshed? That would be how I interpret that. Uh, it, it is pretty crop dependent and also equipment and scale dependent. Generally, what I do is I tend to take that material out of the field and compost it. If you're doing brassicas, it's especially important to take that material out of the field, especially if you're in an area where you have um, black leg or black rot, a lot of that disease can overwinter on the woody material and you want to get that out of the field and um, composted and broken down as quickly as possible. If removing it is, is prohibitive, then it's a good idea to go ahead and just um, chop it up and break it and, and incorporate it into the soil so that it can fully decompose um, going into the winter so you don't have that carryover of soil-borne disease potential. 
Okay, great. Well, we're running out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone who submitted questions. Thank you so much, everyone, Michaela and Lori, and especially Keith and Sam for taking time off your farms to share your experience with us.